Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you may be, anywhere across the world. Thanks so much for joining us live here today for Serverless Office Hours. Uh, we are streaming today, not on AWS Twitch channel. It's actually the New York Summit going on today, so um, they have commandeered the Twitch uh, channel for that. So don't go there yet. Stay here. Um, head over, you know, join us here on Serverless Land, which is on the YouTube channel and also via LinkedIn Live. Uh, my name is Julian Wood. I'm a developer advocate as part of the serverless team here at AWS. And I am super duper happy today to introduce two absolutely fa uh, fabulous guests. We've got uh, Gregor Hoppe, who's an enterprise strategist, and we've got uh, Luis Morales, who is a senior solutions architect. Gregor and Luis, how on earth are you today? Very good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I, I mean, Gregor is. Uh, famous within this industry as a you know book writer of enterprise architecture patterns and has uh, Gregor, how long have you been at AWS now? Uh, almost two and a half years. Ah, excellent. So yeah, accomplished author, um, somebody we uh, love reading and learning about here uh, at AWS. And uh, Louis, I know you also you're actually uh, streaming now from uh, from Munich, and I know you're from Germany. So yeah, how how long have you been at AWS, and what's your role uh, at AWS? Mm -hmm. It's almost uh, three years, and I'm working as a solutions architect in the digital native business field. Ah, excellent. Well, we've got a lot to talk about, um, a super packed show today, but just looking back over the last week uh, in the world of serverless and AWS, we're actually doing a bit of a trifecta, a sort of mini series, if you call it, uh, talking about infrastructure as code slash software, different kind of tools. Uh, two weeks away, two weeks ago, we looked at the serverless framework, and last week we looked at the uh, AWS SAM Accelerate, and Luca Mazzaliero showed us uh, how the new SAM Accelerate uh, makes your testing so much uh, uh, better. And this week's going to be a bit of a CDK, but that's just a bit of a teaser what we're going to be talking about shortly. Um, what's new in AWS? Um, not a whole bunch of super new things over the past kind of week, uh, just some sort of DynamoDB and Cognito things which happened uh, a few weeks ago. In terms of blog posts, certainly have a look at the In Case You Missed It. That's what the ICMYI post is. And that's everything going on with serverless for Q2 2022. David Boyne has recently joined our team and he's been doing some uh, uh, amazing work. Uh, so yeah, worth looking at that to do a catch up if you want to know what's going on. Um, I will talk about it uh, a little bit later, but also Ben Smith has done a blog post on the Step Functions work workflows collection. So this is how to write step functions in that ASL. And it's on a website, on serverless land. And uh, as with the serverless patterns we already have, now you can download the serverless workflows. And they're even better because there's even a one-click deploy that you can do to discover really good ways to be able to use um, step functions. It is AWS Summit season uh, at the moment. All the European summits are, are over. Um, Gregor, Luis, and I actually met up at the Berlin Summit, which is a month ago, I think, now. So that was nice to meet up in person. New York Summit is on today, and we've got a few other summits coming up. So if you are local to any of those areas, that would be super great to um, be able to show you a bit more about AWS, and you can come with uh, interesting questions and learn about more what we do. But today, we're all talking about infrastructure as actual code. And it is sort of about CDK if you're worrying about what it is. So Gregor and Lu uh, Luis, I know you've been doing a lot of work about this uh, together recently. And it's not just about the CDK constructs and all the sort of deep weeds of CD how CDK works. But yes, tee us up and let us know what you're going to be talking about. Yeah, so, so much of this is a result of, I'm a firm believer that as architects, we should be looking at things from different levels of abstraction meaning you know sometimes we should really dig in and and build things so should architects code yes they should code but not with the goal to be the best coders but rather to to get more insights into sort of how we can actually use tools together and this is how this started actually us building some serverless solutions doing some automations and then starting to think about that in this context automation is actually something very different I love that because some of the some of the gatekeeping people talk about. Oh, well, if you're not writing real software code, um, you're not really a developer. But you know, I certainly think, and I've spoken at length before about how in a serverless application, your architecture and your application are in fact the same thing. Your infrastructure and your application is so tightly bound together, and controlling that as software um, has some superpowers, which I know you're going to get into. Mm -hmm. So you know, should I switch? Should I switch over to your uh, laptop? Let's, yes. Well, yeah, I think okay. we're ready to share what we have. There we go. Well, over to you. And also, we are live in serverless office hours. Uh, Gregor and Luis do have a whole bunch of content to get through, so we will be certainly taking uh, questions a little bit later. But yeah, we are live. Gregor and Luis are here, so send your questions via uh, via the comments, and we will um, we will address them uh, when we can. Cool. So let's let's get started. So. 
in our industry, we, we like buzzwords, right? We like slogans. And one slogan that we actually use quite a lot is infrastructure as code. And that's a good thing because programmability and making things codable is a key aspect of the cloud. However, one other aspect of our industry is that we are not terribly good at naming generally. <laughs> and that is the case here as well. So much of what we're going to talk about today is that infrastructure as code is great, but the name isn't exactly right because it doesn't just deal with infrastructure. And Julian already hinted at this, right? In the serverless environment, it is about much more than infrastructure. And let's be honest, you know, not all automation that we see, you know, I would qualify as real code and we'll share more about why we mean that. So we're here to convince you that there's a new acronym you should be using and that should be infrastructure as actual code. So you're witnessing the crafting of a new buzzword. So I mentioned that, you know, the starting point for this is automation, right? Like we're used to, you know, doing infrastructure as code out of a notion of automating things. And automation is not a new concept by any means, right? Here's a Ford Model T assembly line, basically the folks who sort of invented, you know, automated assembly. But what we need to keep in mind is that we are no longer, you know, building Ford Model T's. So when we automate things, it's not just about, you know, making a car that's any color as long as it's black, but that we can do much more with automation in the cloud. Yeah, and as Gregor mentioned, uh, entering the, the cloud automation isn't just about efficiency. So when we think what we could gain from automation, things like speed. So deploying much more often because we already learned how to bring the pain forward, how to automate things and get quicker into production. That's one of the, of the key aspects, but also repeatability. So especially when we think about manual uh, processes, there, there can be a lot of opportunity for human errors that can be introduced. But on the other hand, if we try to automate it, uh, we can really repeat it. And this, of course, gives us also more confidence in, in the overall application. So it's a lot easier to deploy 20 times a day than maybe once once a quarter or even longer because the the overall processes uh, have to have to be um, adopted for this also with already existing uh, automation disposability becomes a thing because if you think uh, especially in in serverless uh, era disposability could mean that i could quickly spin up a sandbox environment try out my application and after I have used it and don't use it anymore, I can easily uh, delete the resources, don't pay anything anymore. And uh, this way, it's uh, also, of course, uh, even better. And of course, transparency. So the transparency aspect is not only there when you think about all the possibilities you have in terms of auditing when it comes to cloud, but the overall processes in which step are we currently with certain pipelines? That is uh, really, really interesting, can be measured and by this also improved. Mm. So what we, what we see is that in the cloud automation isn't like making Ford Model T's, it's not just about efficiency and repeating the same thing, but automation plays a much bigger role. And I would go as far as to say that if you take automation away from the cloud, you're more likely actually looking like the same old data center. And of course, that's not terribly interesting. So in the beginning, I had hinted also that much of the work we're sharing today is the result of looking at things from different levels. And yeah, I mentioned I'm an architect. I like to think like an architect. So I want to show what I look like or what I look at when I think about cloud automation, which is much more than just efficiency. And sort of a common complaint about architects is sometimes that we always take things to a high level and sort of draw 
pretty pictures, but maybe lose touch with reality. But I think it's actually very different. As an architect, we can use higher level abstractions, but those abstractions, they don't dummify things. They actually um, amplify the essence of what we're looking at. It, you know, these abstractions get rid of the noise and actually allow us to sharpen our thinking, to think more deeply about the concepts and actually to communicate them also more broadly. So these abstractions are actually very useful. So let's do that for cloud automation. So when I think about cloud automation, as an architect, I think about abstraction. How can I explain what cloud automation does? Now, the first thing that cloud automation does is it provisions, right? And this we do with CloudFormation, Terraforms, many other things. You describe the resources that you have and the system will provision the resources. You know, little trivial example here, some virtual machines and load pellets and an API gateway. Now, these resources on their own don't really do much except maybe consume energy and cost money. So you need to deploy some things onto these virtual machines to actually get a working application. And that's the second aspect of cloud automation. Now, this still doesn't do anything useful because I have four disconnected pieces. So I need to wire this solution together, right? What am I load balancing? What endpoint do I have my API gateway? I need to compose and interconnect the pieces. And invariably, the pieces I deploy, they're similar, but they're usually not 100% identical. They might have primaries and secondaries. I'm going to have different kinds of configuration that I need to set. So here's a great example about how having an architectural view gives us a better vocabulary, right? Gives us a better way to express what all the different nuances of what we call automation actually is. And this makes it also super plausible why this is not just about efficiency. We're doing more than just you know, provisioning resources. We're really actually composing and configuring applications. Now, coming back to the, the buzzwords, right? Coming back to the infrastructure as codes. One of my slogans is that we as architects, we live in the first derivative. Like if there's no change in your system, you don't need a lot of architecture, right? You get it working somehow and you let it run ever after. Now, luckily for us architects, that's pretty rare these days because everything is changing all the time. And that's why I often have the slogan that says architects, we live in the first derivative. We engage when there's a lot of change in the system. And, you know, uh, Keith Morris is a good friend of mine, and he's written the defining book on infrastructure as code back in 2016. And that was super popular and really brought our this into the forefront of our mindset. And then two years ago, uh, at the end of 2020, like a year and a half ago, he wrote a second edition. And the second edition has the same title, but it has a very different subtitle. And if you think about our premise of infrastructure's actual code, he started with managing servers. So it was just about infrastructure in 2016. And in 2020, it's about systems. So he also saw that there's more about this than just infrastructure. And it's about dynamic systems. So it's not so much about how do we deploy a bunch of stuff, but how do we deal with change? And I think that gives us an interesting insight on, well, what kind of change do we have in the system that we automate? And actually, actually uh, dealing with change is quite common these days. If you think about all the different uh, dimensions of, of change, so a change in application, deploying new features, but of course, also changing environments uh, because you want to increase the confidence uh, in general if uh, your business logic is uh, applied correctly. So going from dev to test to prod, it changes. But sometimes change happens. So changing reality in, in that sense that you might have to uh, log into a, a production server in order to apply a hotfix or uh, some configuration changes. That's all the, the aspects of dealing with change. And coming back uh, to 
how we think uh, from an infrastructure perspective, we're dealing with change. There, there is the declarative provisioning that uh, came up a long time ago. What it does, it takes your desired state. So in this example, a load balancer, two VMs, and um, <laughs> it compares it with the, with the actual state. What do we have currently in, in the system? And what the infrastructure as code tool normally does is to apply changes to come to the desired state. So in that case, to turn the two gigabyte VM into a four gigabyte, it has to obviously resize the server. Additionally, one other server needs to be provisioned and on top, it needs to be wired with a, with a load balancer. And for this approach, uh, there were a lot of different concepts uh, historically um, evolved. So it all started with automation scripts in, in order to, uh, to mm -hmm. trigger and uh, request certain APIs to come to the desired state. But over time, that evolved. So right now, you can find much more language types that are document-oriented. Some of them are functional or even object oriented. And the key point here is, even though we want to have a declarative provisioning process, we don't have to use a declarative language for that. And from the automation languages, as mentioned before, for document oriented, so JSON, YAML based, for example, we see CloudFormation, we see Terraform, or on the on the functional side, there is uh, also some some starters with Pulumi, with F# -sharp, or BCL, uh, which is proprietary, and Q is also uh, moving in that direction. Additionally, object-oriented uh, languages come more and more popular. For example, the AWS CDK or Pulumi as well. But today we want to focus on the object-oriented part because actual code. <laughs> <laughs> because actual code, that's right. So when when we want to, to understand AWS CDK and how infrastructure's actual code can look like, let's take a look at a simple example. So as seen before, we want to, to have a simple web application and we want to uh, put this in, in front of a load balancer to, to actually make it accessible. The first thing that you would do, especially in a, in a container-based and uh, VM-based environment, would be to set up the virtual private network. So in, in this single line, you can see uh, there is a VPC created. It's in uh, maximum two AZs. And what the, the tool does in, in, in the background is actually to create much more than that. So with this single line, of AWS CDK, it produces already 270 lines of cloud formation because it has to take care about the, the VPC. It has to take care about the subnets. So it has public and private subnets in each of the AZs. It has to handle the, the root tables, NAT gateway, and the internet gateway. So a lot to do in only a single line of code. But that's only the, the networking perspective. We want to include there something or run there something. And there you can see already in the uh, ECS cluster that we set up here, we reference the, the previously created VPC really as code. So what you can see overall, it gives you a more familiar language, in, in this case, TypeScript, um, so you can use classes, you can method um, as you would normally do it in an object-oriented language. But as mentioned before, that's more the networking perspective. Let's go, go a bit uh, further because we want to create an actual application on top of this. And what we can use here is one of the CDK patterns. So you see the network load balance Fargate servers. What it means it is a managed container uh, environment that's handled by, by a load balancer. And we only have to point to the clusters or so to the networking aspect and also to, to the image 
that it has to, to run. So what you can see, it has abstraction. So same defaults, reusable classes, we can use them to combine more useful or more broader architectures in, in that sense. And also, if I want to, to add, for example, a domain name, you can see it already provides me some, uh, some um, auto-completion um, suggestions. So therefore, to support auto-complete inline documentation are an important aspect for, for a developer. And uh, that's what CDK can bring. And overall, it's available in Python, in JavaScript, TypeScript, Java, C Sharp, and uh, in Go, we have the developer problem. And if we take a closer look of what the CDK actually can bring to us, there are three major aspects. So high level constructs, open source ecosystem, and the object oriented code library. And when it comes to, to the high level constructs, um, the, the base layer for CDK is the so-called uh, so layer one. It is automatically generated based on cloud formation. So it's solely the cloud formation resources. It doesn't come with additional methods uh, you might want to, to use. Therefore, there's a second layer, the AWS constructs. So it's already an abstraction on top of these constructs and it provides you additional methods for, for security, uh, for example, so granting uh, rights and, and things like this. But as we have seen before with the ECS patterns, we can also have purpose-built constructs on top of it, which might be opinionated. So the VPC was a level two? VPC was a level two okay. indeed. Okay. And for the network balance, uh, load balance, fire service, yeah. of course, we speak about purpose-built. Additionally, we have an open source ecosystem. So you can see the CDK roadmap overall in, in GitHub. It's, it's uh, managed there. Um, you can also see other uh, projects like Awesome CDK, which includes some tools, tips, and tricks, and uh, whatnot to, uh, to be referenceable. But also, we have things like the CDK patterns. And last but not least, the right. object-oriented aspect. Right. I think that's easily underestimated the power of this. And this is why we keep coming back to actual code. Because when we say, you know, documented versus actual code, actual code these days is object-oriented. And we've gotten a little bit used to it. But in the end, the, the reason we can build complex applications these days, like the kind of amazing things that we build, is only really possible because we have the power of object orientation, right? Because that gives us the abstractions of having higher level concepts that hide some of the complexity. We can encapsulate, right? We can have data and functionality in the same in the same classes. We can model complex domains that we can compose, that we can inherit from, and we can do things like mocking, right? Because we have uh, identical interfaces and we can swap out implementations. And these are all things that the object-oriented constructs bring us. So when we say CDK as infrastructure as actual code, to us, that's a very big deal. And what we're going to do is we're going to start using all of things, these, these, these techniques, all these mechanisms to really rethink what automation means to us because we have much more powerful ways now to express the kind of automation we want to do. It's not a list of resources that get deployed, but it's going to be much more. And of course, the perfect place to bring that to life is for serverless applications. And the first thing we like to highlight when we talk about serverless, we don't mean just Lambda, right? Serverless isn't just a different way of deploying and, and running a piece of code. It is actually a complete ecosystem, rather right? well, that ecosystem includes data storage, you know, things like DynamoDB. I'm a big fan of DynamoDB within a serverless context because it has some really neat um, atomic operations that normal databases would not have. And of course, integration, right? We saw composing before. You need to wire your application together. And in a serverless environment, you have 
more small pieces that you need to wire together. So all these different integration services, you know, ranging from event bridge and step functions, API gateways, of course, SQS, SNS, right? Those are all an integral part of the serverless ecosystem. So I always remind folks, look at the whole thing because to build service applications, you will need all these pieces. It's not just about a single isolated Lambda function, right? And that's why we build serverless applications as fine-grained, smaller pieces that are loosely coupled and joined together. And this has a big impact on how we look at automation. Right? The one part that's obvious is that we're going to do a lot less provisioning, right? Because it's serverless, right? That is already done for you, right? So in the end, we can see that a key part of automating in a serverless environment is the composition. Because provisioning is already done. Deployment is very easy, but wiring these pieces together become key aspects of your application architecture. Like what kind of granularity do I have? How big are my functions? How big are my lambdas? What depends on what? What is the data and control flow through this? Is this synchronous? Is this asynchronous, right? Is this one-to-one? -one? Is it one-to-many? And of course, which other managed services do I use? How do I interact with a DynamoDB or with the step functions or event bridge? So we see that on one hand, the composition aspect becomes much more pronounced. And we also see that in this composition aspect, there's much more richness for serverless applications than you might otherwise have. And with that, we can sort of make a a strong statement that in a serverless environment, the automation isn't about provisioning deployment. The automation is really about composition and configuration. That clearly shows why we say it's not just about infrastructure. It is much more than that. And Lewis hinted at that the CDK has an open ecosystem where people contribute. And what you see is what's being contributed, these patterns, they're also not about infrastructure. These patterns are about composing pieces together and finding higher level abstractions. Sometimes as simple as combining two different pieces, but sometimes much more complex constructs. But we're not talking infrastructure here. We're really talking application topologies. So let's make all this theory real and let's take a serverless application and see how automation with CDK is something very different than just what we traditionally think as, as deployment. And we call this um, with a great title, Composing Serverless Applications with Automation Abstractions. But the reality of this actually is a lot easier to grasp. And our starting point is we're going to use a simple sample application. And this sample application is actually almost 20 years old. It comes from my book that Bobby and I wrote, Enterprise Integration Patterns. And even though it's you know, already almost out of its teenage years, the concepts remain totally relevant because the book talks about fine-grained, distributed, loosely coupled applications. And we just saw this is exactly what serverless applications are like except with a much more powerful machinery underneath that we wish we would have had back then when we wrote the book. So it's a great exercise to say, hey, how can we implement these patterns and these sample applications on a much more powerful ecosystem, the AWS serverless ecosystem? The sample application is easily complained. It's a fictitious domain. Well, the domain is actually not fictitious. The domain is you want to get a mortgage for your house, right? So you go to a loan broker, the loan broker talks to the credit bureau, gets some data on your credit worthiness, and then the loan broker talks to multiple banks to get an offer, like what kind of interest rates, what kind of loan terms can you get? And then they present you back with the best offer. Yeah, some like very normal, simple application. And when we translate this into a serverless environment, we can see that we start to have some of these exact serverless pieces out of the ecosystem. Right? We have some 
orchestration. There's multiple steps that need to be done. So we need to manage a process. We need to get the credit score first. Then we need to request the quotes. Then we wait for responses. Maybe we time out, hopefully not. Then we get the results and return them to the customer. Then, of course, we have runtime elements, you know, like banks, but we also have connecting elements, right? That's why I said SQS and SNS are such essential parts of serverless applications. We have pub sub channels and messaging channels, and we have an aggregator that can get all the quotes from the different banks together and put it in one place. So what we can see is we can use this pattern language, right? And this is the pattern language from the book, message filters, aggregators, right? Message channel, pub sub channels. That's the vocabulary that we can use to describe our application. And then in a second step, we can map that to the services. And in this case, the way we've done this, there's really two main parts of implementing this. Well, you might say three, one part is just small, right? One part is the orchestration, right? And that is step functions, right? That's the serverless cloud native orchestrator that we have. Then you have the credit bureau, that's the small part. That's just a Lambda function. And then you have this pattern where these messages flow, right? They go in a pub sub channel, then every bank gets a message, then we do some filtering. We explain later why we do that. Then all of them respond to a message channel and then we aggregate them together. And that's a common pattern that we use. And that pattern is called scatter gather, right? We have a request for quote, we scatter it across all the banks and then we gather it back together. And you can see how this simple application starts using quite a nice set of serverless services out of our serverless ecosystem, right? Here's PubSub, that's SNS, the banks are can Lambda functions, the message filter is a great fit for EventBridge, then we have SQS, and then we have Dynamo, DynamoDB as the place where we store the data. So what we're gonna do is use this view, right? This is a very, you might say, architectural or abstracted view that explains the essence of what our application looks like. And what we're gonna try to do is, can we write automation code that actually resembles this picture? Well, that's exactly what it was has done. All right. And I think that's also the, the beauty, again, of abstractions. Because coming back to CDK, below you see the CDK constructs. So Lambda function, Lambda destination, SQS queues, and whatnot. But as Gregor mentioned, we, we might want to abstract this away to think more about the integration patterns. So think rather with what kind of filter do, do I need? What to aggregate for? How to do the, the publish subscribe mechanism? And on top, you might also want to, to lay out business domain constructs. So not think about a Lambda function anymore or a kind of event processor, but instead of a bank or the, the loan broker, which is all around the, the orchestration part could be uh, elevated already to, to the business domain constructs. So you have really three different languages, right? Three different vocabularies. Yeah. And traditionally, people always think automation is just sort of the bottom kind of thing, like here's a queue. But we find that we can use CDK to also express the other languages. And to, to make this a bit more concrete, let's take a look at only the, the banks. So zoom in a bit, take a look, what does a bank have to do and how we can automate the, the infrastructure. So the, the CDK view and uh, especially the, the top part, um, you can see for creating a bank, of course, we have to specify a bit the, the configuration of a bank. What's the bank idea or the, the name of a bank? What's the base rate? what's the maximum loan amount you could apply for, and what's also the minimum credit score. And additionally, you, you might have also things like an event bus that you want to, to compose in, in that sense. And these are really your two languages, right? The top part uses the language from the domain, right? This is not about lambdas and things, right? This is about, it's a bank, what is the credit score? What's the name of this bank? And then the bottom half is your other language, right? There you talk about, lambdas, right? So you can see that 
you can use the same programming language, but you use two different domain languages in a way, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And also the the automation stack that uh, Gregor introduced. You can you can clearly see this, and you don't have to take care about the the create bank part where you be more in a in a low abstraction level, but in, instead think about the intent. And we can uh, even uh, enlarge the the example. So let's take a look at the the next part. After a bank uh, replies if they they are okay with uh, giving out a, a credit. You, you maybe have to filter certain messages because maybe uh, the, the loan you applied for is too high, so a bank won't uh, give you anything. And additionally, you might don't need all the information for your further processing. So we also want to do a content filter there. And message filter in general, as mentioned, um, sorts out certain messages. So in, in the picture, you clearly can see the, the red box um, get eliminated by the, the message filter. And for, for the content filter, all the unnecessary information or the information we don't want to focus on is also not included anymore because we want to, to focus on so the certain if, things. If you're going to write the book today, then the message filter would be called the squid game pattern. Right. If you don't, you get eliminated. So not everybody makes it. <laughs> All right. So take a look how we could implement uh, implement these integration patterns with CDK. So that's the the real implementation we have used for for the for the overall example. And you can see from from the first line, we we have a message filter where we only want to. Um, use messages where certain fields exist so in this case a bank id as as a sort of flag that yeah mm. there there is a quote we want to consider that it's a meaningful message without a bank id we don't want it right yeah it, it doesn't make sense and the same is true for uh, the the content filter so we only want to take a look at certain fields in in that case the the payload itself because it has of course, also a lot of metadata that gets sent uh, and is concluded in certain messages. So we want to filter that out. And, and this really speaks the language of the middle layer, right? This is the pattern language, right? Now here, the domain language you use, right, is message filter and content filters, and that's the middle part of yeah. the three layers that you show. Right? Definitely. And the last part is, of, go of course, about integrating all these bits and pieces. So going from a source event bus, what is the target queue, what kind of message filter and what kind of content filter do we have to apply? And if we take a closer look, how a message filter, for example, looks like. So with the with a simple one line, there there is of course some uh, composition and abstraction going uh, going on in the in the background. So to implement a message filter. Um, we make use of the event bus um, implementation of a message filter. So we can use there the detail response payload, and we want to make sure that a bank ID exists. And this gives us the, the higher level uh, abstraction of the message filter. So there's a piece of event bridge down there, right? The syntax of the, the predicate, that's low. That's the bar, the base layer of your language, right? Yeah. And of course, also on, on the content filter side, with a simple one-liner, you, you have to apply this also. In, in this case, uh, again, on uh, event bus. And there, uh, it is the, the implementation is based on a rule target input. But the, the higher level construct gives us actually the flexibility to switch out the, the actual implementation. So that's where, where also the beauty comes. But there you can see how to, to implement such a content filter. And the part that I like the most is because I never sure is a dollar dot response payload, a dollar dot detail dot payload dot response payload. What I can do now, I can type like content filler dot control space or whatever my IDE does, right? And here's my selection, right? I develop software the way I would normally write object oriented code, right? Not by string matching, right? And at least that helps me a lot. Yeah. 
And the last part is, of course, sticking the, the two concepts uh, together. So the message filter and the content filter, and that can also be done in uh, CDK. It's again, abstracted away, but the concrete implementation is about the event pattern. It's about adding a target to a certain event bus rule, uh, which you can which you can see here. Yeah, that's CDK constructs, right? This is event bus, you know, patterns, targets, right? That is classic CDK, right? That's your lower layer of them. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look again what we stated in, in the beginning, that cloud automation isn't just about efficiency. So we discussed about speed, confidence, repeatability, disposability, and transparency. But another really important aspect is the aspect of abstraction, because that gives you a different way of working, different way to think about the, the overall application. Yep, and we, we talked a little bit about sort of buzzwords or methods we use. And one important method we use these days is domain-driven design, right? We realize that good software is really one that models a domain very well. And usually we do this in the business domain, right? Just like we did like banks and interest rates and credit scores, right? That's the domain model. But then usually there's a huge jump from there into oh, uh, event bridge, your know, SQS, SNS, right? And that's a bit of a disconnect. So what we've achieved here, right? What Lewis has shown is that we make a domain model, right? It's a domain language for your application topology. Like how is the bank connected to the aggregator, right? Where's the message filter? What does it filter by? Is this a pub sub channel? Is this a point-to-point a -point channel, right? And yeah, what we are making here and what we can only do because we have actual code, right? Because we have object-oriented code, we can really build a domain model for your application topology. And we think that is actually pretty cool. Our example is still fairly simple, but this is a completely different view on what application, uh, what automation does, right? And we sort of jokingly say like, well, if it's not infrastructure as code, right, what is it? And maybe this is really more considered architecture as code, right? Because this describes the topology, it describes how things are laid out and put together. And that is really the architecture of the application. And now you can describe that, not in like pictures and sketches and whatever, right? You can describe this as object-oriented code written in like Python or TypeScript, right? Or if you think architecture is too fuzzy a word, right? Maybe call it topology as code. And I think that is really a completely different way without the cloud and with automation, without automation, we would have never been able to do it. And with infrastructure as actual code, we can take it to a level where we can describe the topology as code. And just to make a little bit of an architect's pitch, why this is so important is because your application's topology defines most of your application's essential properties. So here's one of my favorite examples, right? Two application topologies using the same components, A, B, C, and D. And the only difference is they're wired together differently. The architecture, the topology is different. Now, if I asked you, do you think these two applications have different properties? You would probably very quickly say, yes, they have very different properties. They almost have exactly opposite properties of each other, right? On the left-hand side, you have clean dependencies. It's easy to replace, you know, C with C star if you want, but you probably have longer latencies and you might have a single point of failure. If C goes out, B can no longer talk to D. Well, on the right-hand side, it's exactly the opposite. You have resilience and short paths, right? A can talk to D directly, also regardless if C is there or not, but you have a lot more interdependency, so it's probably more difficult to make a change or replace one component. So even though you use the same pieces, the way it's wired together, the topology gives the system completely different properties. And being able to capture this in code, I think is pretty nifty. So time for reflection. <laughs> so what have we got here in, in general? We saw from, from the general automation uh, stack, we're speaking about deploying, of course. 
be speaking about composition and configuration, and we can do this all in code. So we're able to abstract away the, the low level details with a domain specific language, uh, which could help us really to implement loosely coupled and distributed solutions. So that's what modern cloud apps are. So, and you have the possibility to, to make your own DSL on top of CDK, uh, which make it actually executable. And therefore you can specify the architecture or the topology as code. So quick, quick comment though. So a couple, I mean, we're at the beginning of this, right? We started building with this and we think this is really cool, but there's also some questions we still have, right? So if you paid really close attention, it was a little bit surprisingly convenient that EventBridge exactly had a message filter and a content filter, right? Because it has the, the rules and the um, basically the target definitions have a content filter built in. So one question is, well, what if this doesn't match as well, right? Do we automatically recognize that if I need a content filter and an aggregator that we automatically switch from using EventBridge to using Lambda or something else, right? So these are things we're definitely thinking about sort of how smooth is this transition and, and well, how powerful can you make really this translation layer? But we're definitely gonna start tinkering with this a bit more because having a programmable layer for this domain language for our topology, I think is really worth exploring more. So the key thing that we summarize here is that originally people thought about automation so as a little bit of an afterthought, right? I do some stuff, I go on the console, I click around, I get this thing working, looks good. And I'm like, I should really automate this, right? So, okay, let me go make some cloud formation. This is very different, right? In this case, we've elevated automation to being an integral part of your software delivery lifecycle, right? You're automating as you're coding and it defines your architecture choices, right? If you have high levels of automation, you probably make finer grain applications that you would not have done if you didn't have this kind of automation. So what we're really doing here is we're blurring the lines between writing functional code and writing platform code, writing you know, automation code, because the two go exactly hand to hand, to, uh, hand in hand together. So in summary, what we actually learn is that you know, the serverless ecosystem plus being able to express your intent with design patterns plus having CDK as a you know, object-oriented code library that lets you express this, that's what really modern cloud application should be like. Now, there's lots more stuff about this. So we have some resources. So I like to, like to write books. So in my case, I invite you to have a look at my website, Architect Elevator, and then... Lewis likes to write stuff that actually runs, so he has some cool stuff on serverless land. So you can you can find some some more resources, including the CDK GitHub uh, repository uh, when you scan the QR code, or I think uh, Julian, you could post it in in the comments. Yeah, I've already I have posted that. Awesome, thanks a lot. Uh, so you can take a look, you can run it, you can uh, execute it as it's serverless. It's easily uh, disposable. So uh, quite quite convenient and yeah take take a look at this contribute um, leave comments uh, we're really interested in in that kind of things cool so yeah thanks for paying attention and let's see if we have any questions unfortunately with the screen set up we can't see the chat so um, no that's fine I, I will certainly bring up some questions I can do that on the screen um yeah just from my point of view I really like I've always been a proponent of trying to tie the the business and the IT and technology closer together I came from an infrastructure background and worked in uh, banks for many many years and that is you know always historically the business is one thing the application developers do another thing and then the infrastructure people try and support all three and it's <laughs> It's always chaos, and that's that's one of the things that really drew me to serverless is bringing that uh, application, business, infrastructure all closer together. So, I love I love this concept of first of all bringing bringing it all all together, and I like your explanation of you know separating the business domain and the application topology, and they are separate things, but how you can you can model that in code and object orientated code. How do you then think about business people being able to understand this code? 
Uh, would business people ever be building some of this code themselves as part of the business domain? Or is it just a, a way that code can implement the business domain in a simple way? How, how do you think about the sort of modern, not architect, but the modern business person um, wrapping their heads around this? <clears throat> So, so I think abstractions, I got to be careful. I got the, the sun glaring behind me here. Yeah. So, so I think having this kind of abstractions serve a, a really useful purpose. And that purpose is that it makes your technical decisions more visible to the business user, right? You're closing the gap between what is actually running and what the business user thinks. So I think that's a universally good thing and what you need for that you need a language to express that right and that's what we've done in this case with the integration patterns right i think a business user can easily understand what the message filter is and you can have the conversation about well is a bad message identified by missing bank id or is a bad message identified by a missing interest rate right and you know the business user can say okay do it this way or do it that way so i think that's definitely positive um, does this mean that the business users have to write the code? I'm a bit more flexible on this, right? There's a lot of talk about low code and no code and citizen programmer. And I think that has its place, but I'm also just equally as happy as long as the folks who write the code, the developers sit with the business users and have this dialogue and basically write it together. I consider this just as fine or maybe, maybe even better, right? Like collaborate, right? Get closer to each other have this dialogue. So we don't need to throw it all over the wall to the business users, but we want to have code that's readable in a way that the business user can make sense out of it. Yeah, well, I think um, business users have been architecting some of the most powerful businesses in the world in Excel macros. Uh, yeah. And that's, you know, that's VB code and probably half of your banks and financial institutions are using yeah, that. Yeah. So <laughs> We're probably not that far off. Um, another thing that came to mind was sort of this uh, interconnection with CDK. And I'm not sure if you're aware of hexagonal architectures. That is also about creating those interfaces between your uh, between different components. Does this tie into that? I think it could, right? So basically what it's trying to do is, is have a vocabulary of what the touch points around a component look like, right? If I understand correctly in the hexagonal architectures. So you could model this here as well, right? You would probably have a, a wrapper of a component that takes certain, you know, standard parameters and what's the inputs, what's the outputs. That would be an interesting experiment. We took the pattern-based approach because we wanted something that expresses rich intent. Like we wanted to say, not just how it's wired together, but we wanted to also say, well, 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 why does this component exist? Like, what's the purpose, right? It's like, hey, you filter out bad messages. Oh, the other thing gets rid of all the noise in the message. You know, the third one combines all the messages into one. So, so that's why we started this way. But um, if you want to um, make a language that's closer to just topology, I think hexagonal could be, could be an interesting way to do that. Yeah. I think at least it opens up the discussions of how the different interfaces connect and bringing that business domain into it is super useful. Just yet yeah, to, to bring up some of the um, questions from people watching. Thanks so much, Peter, joining us from YouTube. So uh, do we go from three layered monolithic apps running on hardware over microservices running on a platform using infrastructure as code to domains that contain business functionality, composition, config, provisioning? I, I sort of think so is my point of view. I know it's a long sentence. Uh, Gregor and Luis, what would you say? So, I mean, definitely, I mean, there's a couple of dimensions in here. I'm trying to, to parse the sentence, right? So, yes, I think we're definitely going away from monolithic things running on hardware to more fine-grained composed applications running on a platform, right? I think that's the, that's the starting position. So, we agree with that. And I think what we have done is saying, once you have taken that step, you can also take the next step that the sentence here refers to, right? So you, you take the machinery a little bit away and you elevate the abstraction. Now you're talking about business functionality, right? Is the bank ID the defining element? Is the rate the defining element? You talk about composition, right? How it's wired together. So and I think that is sort of the second part of what we've done. Um, the only thing that I would say is in our environment, the provisioning is becoming less of an aspect, right? It's like 
because provisioning is essentially done for you in the serverless environment. So that one I was would maybe scratch, but the rest I absolutely agree with. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to briefly touch on this one, but uh, not just. Uh, could you please do some comparisons between CDK and Terraform? And thank you for these great trips. Um, ne not necessarily about CDK and Terraform, but you know Terraform and SAM and CloudFormation it's, itself, in a way, are declarative programming languages, and CDK is not always seen as declarative, or is it? Or how would you? How do, would you define that? Because I know some people get uncomfortable with the concept of CDK because it, it doesn't have that sort of separation where once CDK is deployed, after the fact, you can't go and really look and see whether your deployment is what you expected it to be. And there's some sort of gray areas with how people think about that. Yeah, for sure. But maybe we have to clarify first, uh, when we speak about CDK, we always refer to AWS CDK because there, there is a, another uh, layer to, to that uh, picture. It's the, the CDK, um, which makes it more convenient to take JSON construct and uh, build objects on top of it. And there's actually a project uh, that does CDK with Terraform. Yes. Um, so that's, that's also convenient. So you might not have to, to choose there. Uh, the same is true for the Kubernetes side. So there is uh, CDKs um which which apply this uh, as well yeah and, definitely. and also oh. i mean as this comment does rightly say uh, you know cdk does rely on cloud formation under the hood so my uh, my question was a little bit clumsy in a way but it was more about the sort of imperative uh, declarative model um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the, the question is the feedback loops as we run more services rather than code. Do you expect cloud formation to get faster? As thing as with all things AWS, things are continually being improved under the hood at the time. I don't have some huge big announcement I can say today that um, cloud formation is immediately faster. Uh, but I know that people in the cloud formation team are working uh, hard on that. Um, from a, thanks, thanks to yes, Mike Louise. for and asking asking questions. Hi there. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> And maybe to, to add uh, for, for the overall loop, there is a CDK watch feature, which uh, gives you a hotspot um, deployment functionality. So especially uh, when, when you're in, in the development cycle, uh, that can speed up things a lot. But uh, as you also had uh, the, the awesome talk around SAM Accelerate mm -hmm. a couple of days ago, uh, that also helps because you don't have to choose the, the tooling suite of SAM or CDK. So there are still uh, some, some opportunities. And there's actually a quite good blog post how CDK and SAM can uh, collaborate uh, quite quite good. And I also wanted to be faster. So let's, let's <laughs> yeah, work. No, exactly. No, nobody's, ever, nobody's ever saying, oh, we want CloudFormation to slow down. So, um, uh, so yes, also, uh, you know, there's a lot of work. And I know the SAM team internally is doing a lot of work to try and uh, support, uh, be, do CDK even better, and even looking at seeing how they can do things with Terraform as well. So you know, this isn't necessarily an either or. Generally, people using CDK are programmers who know Java, Node, Python, all those kind of things. And this is so great that they can build infrastructure in programming languages that they know and often sam and pure cloud formation uh, you know often appeals to operations folk uh, yeah. because they are defining the infrastructure but of course those uh, those lines are blurring uh, from a linkedin user how do you see deployments using cdk by app teams working together with landing zone constructs by a platform team so i suppose this is a, a yeah an interesting question of the the separation of what builders and developers use and what a platform team in a bigger organization would uh, would roll out and I think you hint a little bit, I mean, they can coexist, right? And like infrastructure teams often like more sort of the document oriented languages, right? The Terraforms and cloud formations because they don't need all the object oriented expressiveness and then the application teams very much in favor of, of CDK. So maybe that is where it's an advantage that CDK at this moment yeah, runs on top of, of cloud formation. That way you can, you can combine what you need to, of course, make sure you need to pass basically the the references of your your infrastructure that you have underneath, right? Your landing zone, etc. Those references you need to pass into whatever CDK code you have. But I think at least my thought would be that you can have a reasonable coexistence there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially you know one of our serverless 
uh, amazing uh, customers in Liberty Mutual are, you know, the, in terms of CDK patterns, that's what they do. They create these CDK constructs. And, you know, we've been talking about messaging services and things today, but think of something like API Gateway, where you want to ensure that cer certain security controls or throttling or rate limiting or authorization authentication is built into these constructs. And they create these construct packages. And then when somebody needs a new API, that API Gateway config is just added onto it at, uh, at provisioning slash deployment time. And they just know that runs through their pipeline. It is secure. It is has all the config that they need. And that works really well for them. And I like that sort of separation of duties in a way that you can uh, give developers that uh, the freedom and the agility to go quick and having all those um, enterprise slash platform things. We are running out of time. We over time a bit, but um, we'll go quickly. Just uh, Tim, thanks for joining us as well. I don't know about the C4 model, but uh, I will certainly have a look at that. The C4 yeah, model I provides a great know. way to define infrastructure as but code. I do know, but we can explain offline, right? Like ping us, ping us on LinkedIn or on Twitter. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Definitely. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. I love it when I uh, when uh, questions come up and it makes me uh, introduce and learn uh, learn something. Um, but yeah, yeah. also, uh, Mike, you did say about CDK Watch is great uh, if just the code changes, but as a coding architect, switching service configs, we're not just talking about Lambda code. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> the thing I often say with all these infrastructures, code, infrastructure, software, infrastructure, actual code tools as well. You know, also, you can split up your CloudFormation stacks and have smaller things so your Lambda functions can iterate uh, separately from your DynamoDB uh, databases. Things like VPC configs aren't going to change often, put them into separate uh, stacks. So in a way, I'm, I'm mangling up all the question here and I'm rolling up a few things we've spoken about. But um, yeah, CDK watch, uh, switching service configs, using configuration over code. There's a whole lot, uh, whole lot in, uh, into it. Um, don't create a monolith. Basically, my, big, my point is don't create a massive monolith of CDK code that's going to deploy the world's biggest application. I mean, I have sort of maybe a personal view on this, right? Yeah. I mean, and this is not an AWS spokesperson, but just my view is mm -hmm. what I think happened is that at the beginning, sort of CDK started relatively small, right? Mm -hmm. And then it made sense to build this on top of CloudFormation and to get something going. And I think it's fair to say that we are just now realizing how big a deal it is, right? Like originally it was a little bit, oh, I can put it in a YAML or I can put it in an object library. What's the big deal, right? And now we're starting to realize what the big deal actually is. So I'm also personally hoping that that is a signal to start investing much more into CDK and using this really as a part of how people build modern cloud applications, you know, speeding it up, you know, maybe enhancing it in different ways. I, I don't want to say anything about cloud formation, not cloud formation in this context, but I'm really um, looking for this to become a trigger to also start CDK, you know, to start seeing CDK, not as a sort of a nice hobby add-on project, but as a totally integral part of how you develop these kind of cloud applications. And with that, we should see some, some, some nifty enhancements there. Yeah, definitely. And I, I uh, Massimo Referu, who's one of our um, container uh, team, um, super technical people, gave a presentation re recently. And he, I, I loved his concept. He was he was talking about building on the cloud in terms of AWS, and then building within the cloud. And serverless services and CDK. When you're not just building VPCs and servers and you know memory configuration, and you're building workloads on top of the cloud. When you use serverless services, you in fact the cloud becomes your platform, becomes your operator system becomes whatever and that's within the cloud and your CDK in fact becomes the sort of automation slash pro program of that cloud and so I, I love how you sort of get in you get deeper and deeper into the cloud which gives you more power yeah and that's CDK that is, uh, is is a game changer in this context right yeah excellent um, I'm not quite sure if anyone has a quick things with recommend for use for mocking slash testing of, of the stacks themselves uh, one thing I will say, uh, look at Sam Accelerate from last week and also CDK Synth uh, because you can get, uh, you know, lots of developers love to have everything running locally. What is the cloud? The cloud isn't local. It's all about having this amazing capabilities within the cloud. So Sam Accelerate allows, allows you to run your code locally. It syncs it up to the cloud and you do a lot of your testing in the cloud. Sure, when you have Lambda functions, you want to mock, or mock maybe mock and do some unit testing locally. But then you want to do all your testing, as much of your testing as possible as you can in the cloud. I hope that I'm answering your question about that rather than testing of actual stacks themselves. I'm not sure about maybe, that, but um, maybe yeah. just one thought also, what does hmm. testing mean, right? There's one yeah. way of testing sort of like simulation, kind of kind of run it, right? And we have built several things, but you always run into some limitations. What I would add is things you can definitely do with CDK in the stacks, like do more like 
validations, like I have rules against this, right? Have I published a resource that nobody else is connected to, right? Is sort of, have, do I have a queue out there that nobody is publishing? Um, have I made a lot of loops, right? So I think what you shouldn't underestimate is also to validate. So testing shouldn't just be simulating, but it can also be applying rules, things that you know to be good or things that you know to be bad and run those over some of the constructs and that you can definitely do with, with CDK. Yeah, and a, an interesting uh, sidebar. I was having some meetings uh, last week with actually, I'm in London, so the UK government are building a really cool um, uh, service using all serverless. And they were looking at step functions as an actual testing machine because step functions yeah, can use yeah. any AWS SDK calls. So what can you do? You write something to DynamoDB and you use step functions to read it from DynamoDB. Yeah, and so they yeah, were creating these low code testing frameworks within step functions. So that, and the testing itself isn't code, it's sort of configuration code. So that uh, tied yeah, nicely so with what Sometimes I say, we don't even know how cool this stuff is that we actually <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like amazing. Need to be reminded. You can do with it. Yeah, that's super cool. <laughs> Well, Gregor and Lewis, it's been fascinating to um, reach inside your uh, awesome brains and learn all about this. I think there's a lot more to come with what are we going to be talking about, or, or both of you are uh, 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 going to be talking about. Um, yes, huge amounts to come. I think it's, uh, as with uh, all things in the cloud, we're really early days on, and I think these kind of patterns and languages and the business and architecture and domain-driven design and infrastructure and serverless all coming together is super fascinating. And I'm yeah, I'm super happy to, to be part of it. So yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time on serverless office hours um, to give us your wisdom. And I'm, I, I hope we'll be able to um, have you on again and we can talk about some, uh, some other things or the continuation of this. Yep, anytime. Thanks, everyone. Sure. Well, just, yeah, quickly before we go, um, just oh, next sorry. week, we're talking about infrastructure as code. Well, the Step Functions Workflows connection, Collection, which Ben Smith has put together. So if you are using Step Functions and you want to know how to do a whole bunch of Step Functions patterns, and um, uh, Ben is well aware of Gregor's work, so, so there may be some sneaky uh, architecture patterns built into Step Functions within that, and Ben's okay. going to take us through uh, a look over that. And those patterns are actually available on uh, the serverless, serviceland.com slash workflows or s12d.com slash workflows. This is the serverless patterns collection, which has CDK as well as SAM, Terraform, and serverless framework. Over 300 patterns. You want to connect two or multiple services together. Don't need to go hunting a whole lot of other websites to find that. It's all here uh, live. And this is super. When I'm building serverless apps, this is my this is my go-to to be able to have a look. And of course, generally, serverlessland.com, everything about serverless uh, on AWS. So thank you so much for joining. See you same time, same place uh, next time. And Gregor and Louis, thank you again and appreciate you spending time with us today. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. See you. Cheers.